Um, let us invite Vin back in here, uh, Dr. Stepanitis, uh, and we'll get your, uh, your uh, there you are, you can be heard. Um, this is, uh, thank you both for two really excellent presentations, just opening up a whole world for us. I mean, that should be familiar to us, right? We walk on this earth, we're on this hemisphere, um, and, and we certainly know uh, that these uh, peoples are still with us, right? This is not, this is not, you know, extinction. This is, mm -hmm. things have been changed remarkably and we have to absolutely be cognizant of that. So we should uh, understand the history of peoples who have had uh, a whole lot of injustice uh, levied upon them. Um, I wanna start by asking uh, the, the two of you to sort of just in general place, uh, you know, what you've learned from each other's talks, you know, what Vin, maybe what are a few things that you saw that resonate with the work that you do um, and what you also might say is, is considerably different. Uh, and, and Eduardo to do the same as well, to sort of share a little bit about where you see the similarities I'm always very curious about whether these cultures had exchange with each other. So um, Vin, I'll start with you and just say, you know, what is it that you heard in Eduardo's talk and, and what do you want to have comments on? Well, yeah, I really, really enjoyed that talk. Uh, thank you, Eduardo. And, and, and uh, I, to me, the, there, there's some really striking commonalities. Um, and one of them is about the way iconography relates to power. Um, you know, talking about that broad sweep of human history, again, um, you know, if we drew the timeline of human history, it's not just writing that appears in that last inch or two. The whole sort of idea of social hierarchy, uh, chiefdoms, the state, centralized power, power centralized in, in office holders, uh, the idea of sort of aristocracies, which you found in the South, you see in, in, in Mesoamerica, all of that sort of appears very late in human history. Most of human history societies are egalitarian, communities are small. And so one of the key questions that archeologists have asked and anthropologists have, have written about is, is how, you know, how do you maintain these systems of, of power? How does the state come into being? And, and one piece of that is, is sort of various ideological mechanisms that, that kind of make social differences and hierarchies in particular seem natural, seem justified. And so getting uh, back to some of the themes of Eduardo's talk, um, you know, when you have um, aristocrats, when you have kings or, or paramount chiefs, um, they often sort of symbolically locate them, themselves in places of spiritual power. So just as in the city plans that Eduardo talked about where, where the most important temples in the, uh, were located and rulers were located at the center of the four quarters. Um, the same is true in, in North America as well. The mounds on which chiefs um, houses were placed and on which important temples were placed were, were, were quadrilateral structures, almost always oriented with the cardinal direction. So you were, that you were sort of symbolically placed at the center of the four quarters. And, and often these, these buildings and temples had allusions to being placed at the center of the axis mundi. Uh, and in the Mississippian world, you often in temples had a central fire with four logs um, and a column of smoke going up. Um, the center place in, in um, the iconography is often um, symbolized by a cross in a circle, the, 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 the place where that central axis uh, falls. And, and, and that was sort of reproduced in, um, in architecture with a fire with four logs and that the, the central axis of smoke representing that, that axis. So chiefs houses, temples were located at places of spiritual power. Another mechanism um, that uh, you know, I, I resonates is this notion of the, those who hold these offices being responsible for the continuation of the world. I, I heard that in, in, in Eduardo's talk, the great son of the Notch Nation, the paramount chief, according to the French, rose at dawn every morning and encouraged the sun to come up. Um, uh, and then that was sort of considered essential to the, that ritual was considered essential to the continuation of the world. And the third thing is linking uh, power, political power, 
with um, sort of fundamental ideas like creation or closeness to divinity. Uh, and again, the great sun was considered to be a direct descendant of the sun, uh, which sat at the top of the axis mundi and was again, sort of a connection with sort of natural or spiritual power. So that was one really clear set of connections that I saw. And just very briefly, another thing, uh, there was a question about, and um, you know, the sort of similarities between uh, Mesoamerica and North America. Um, so I'll, let me just comment quickly on that. There, there's, when people move and interact in the ancient times, they bring stuff with them. So, so, you know, there's clear, clear evidence archaeologically that people in the Southwest, the Pueblo in Southwest in ancient times interacted directly with Mexican people because you find Mexican objects in the Southwest and you find Southwestern turquoise mm -hmm. in Mexico. But when you look at the Southeast, you just don't see that. There was, there was, if there was any direct connection at all, it was so ephemeral that, that it didn't leave any material trace. So how do you explain some of these similarities in iconography and in sort of worldview? The stories about the twins that the Maya people told are sometimes almost identical to stories about the twins that were found in Eastern North America. And so my explanation for that is shared heritage. You know, in the broader sweep of time, everyone in the Americas came over the Bering Strait. And I, I suspect they brought with them many sort of shared ideas, shared concepts that sort of developed in slightly different ways over the millennia in different parts of the Americas, but you still see those commonalities. And that's an idea. Um, there was a historian of religion, uh, Mircha Eliade, who was a very prolific writer in the 1950s, who basically developed those ideas. I remember when I was in graduate school, I, I, you know, I read some of that stuff, I said, nah, that, that can't be right. But I now uh, have come to believe that, that that insight was actually there. And that accounts for some of the similarities in sort of cos the cosmologies of Amer Native American people and, and things you see in Northern and Eastern Eurasia as well. That, that to be all so anyway, those are my, those are my, my thoughts on commonalities. Uh, fantastic. Just, um, I wanna have Edward, uh, Eduardo comments on that as well, but just very briefly, um, how about communication between Southwestern Indians and Southeastern Indians? And you know, you would think if they're in communication that they might transfer over mm -hmm. some of that. Was there, was there yeah. interchange between those two regions, Ben? You see it. You see it a little bit. Uh, the best idea is that the maze that comes into the east comes into the east via the southwest, mm -hmm. rather okay. than um, rather than sort of directly from Mexico. Maize is, was domesticated in Mexico. It's a Mexican plant, and it sort of makes its way into North America a, a bit later. Uh, so, so there were connections, and you, in, in particularly in the Mississippi Valley, you sort of you know, in this part of the Southeast, you'll occasionally see something that has Southwest connection. There have been a few turquoise beads and things found and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But again, those connections were not strong. People yeah. in the Great Plains had very strong connections with people in the Southwest uh, in native North America. But those connections are sort of very indirect yeah. when you get to the Southeast. Great. Eduardo, do you want to speak a little bit on commonalities that you saw when um, listening to Vin's talk? Uh, yes, I, uh, to begin with, uh, I have to admit that um, I don't know enough about the Southeast. Uh, I should, I feel, and this, has, uh, this is a problem with many Mesoamericanists. We don't look north uh, other than to say, oh yes, turquoise came from the north. You know, and we sent some chocolate up there and we sent some ceramics and, you know, maybe a few people, but. Yeah, these silos um, are all over academia, by the way. <laughs> so uh, I, I, it was fascinating for me uh, to hear this because I, it's something I need to know more about. And I'm grateful to Ben for presenting it so clearly, so eloquently. Uh, and yes, there are a number of similarities. Um, uh, I should say that uh, the scholar who uh, Vin mentioned, Kent Riley, and I worked with the same advisor. 
So I know Kant. And there was a lot of effort in that period to make these connections uh, more broadly, just as there was uh, a lot of effort in that period to talk about a, t a type of commonality, uh, not just in the Americas, but a, a across the globe with this thing that people called shamanism. Mm -hmm. Finn probably knows more about this than I do. Um, so yes, it was wonderful for me to hear uh, about the mounds, which I knew something of, but not enough um, to look at objects because the objects I know best are from the Southwest you know, Zuni and all of that. Um, and to think about the possibility, and, and I, I, I think Kent Riley has, has proposed this, that there were, uh, you know, there was contact. It might not have been trade in the same way that turquoise came from uh, New Mexico uh, down into Mesoamerica, or gold went up to Mesoamerica from um, Central, what today we call Central America, or um, metallurgy, which doesn't happen in um, Mesoamerica until late, uh, which is another thing that's similar to the Southeast. And, uh, is there the possibility that there was interaction? And Vin, I have a question. Do we know uh, or are we confident about the um, development of metallurgy in the Southeast? Is that something that could have come up from, because generally in Mesoamerica, we attribute it to uh, loose connections to the Andean world and through the Andean world into Central America, then Mesoamerica? Uh, so the answer to that question is that the metallurgy in North America is, is, is fundamentally different from that in Mesoamerica in that, that the copper, for example, in Mesoamerica is smelted copper. Mm -hmm. and so, uh, whereas the, the metallurgy in the Southeast and in the Northeast in Eastern North America was based on a technology called cold hammering of, of mm -hmm. a mineral. Of, there's, na there's a mineral called native copper mm -hmm. um, in the Appalachians and in the Great Lakes, which is almost pure copper that mm -hmm. can be found. And, and, and so the copper objects, and, and copper was the equivalent of gold. It was the precious metal uh, for the ancient people of the South and the Midwest. Um, they worked it into sheets by a process of cold hammering and a needle, so there's no smelting involved. And that technology goes back uh, to probably the, you know, at least the first, if not the second millennium BCE. Oh, yeah, so that's, uh, so well, it's just, it's just two completely it's a different separate world. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. And has anybody ever found cacao in Southeast? Uh, not to my uh, not to my knowledge yet. They have found evidence of it in res chemical residues in pots in the southwest. Right, uh, right. But but not so far in the in the southeast. Um, uh, but there was sort of equivalent. I mean, it wasn't cacao, but it was based on native plants. It was um, a ritual drink called black drink that was brewed from um, a holly, Ilex vomitoria, is called. That's the Latin name. Um, and so, the, you know, there were sort of southeastern equivalents of ritual drinks, mm -hmm. but not involving cacao. It's a fascinating discussion to hear you two learning from each other. It's absolutely, uh, we're, we're learning along with you. Um, let's get through a couple comments and questions that we had. Um, Abby, this isn't as much of a, a question, but a comment earlier, we're talking about Ohio and Abby, uh, uh, our, one of our board members, hello, Abby. Uh, growing up in Ohio, we were taught extensively about ancient native cultures. In fact, the bad weather during the Memorial Golf Tournament is blamed on an insult to Chief Leatherlip of the Lion Ducks, <laughs> whose memorial was moved in building the golf course. It has been returned to its original location. So, uh, <laughs> so there is some uh, uh, good education in some of the schools up there, making sure that people know about the native cultures in those uh, uh, in those areas. 
Um, Katie Williams asked a question, and we can uh, talk a little bit about this. Uh, the question is somewhat uh, towards Eduardo, but Vin, I'm, I'm curious about your take on this, especially because cultures have changed. Not one Native American culture was there, another culture comes. So the question has to do with land acknowledgement statements are starting to make their way into North America. It's also becoming common in Australia, as in this is the native land of you know, Cherokee, et cetera. Uh, is there a similar movement in Mesoamerica to acknowledge the native ownership of land? And I just would add to that question, Vin, the idea of how do you deal with layers of land, right? And, and native land, right? Where do, you, where do you say whose land this was? So Eduardo, why don't you start? Um, well, Mesoamerica is very complicated um, to begin with. There was no such thing as private property in uh, pre-Hispanic Mesoamerica. It was all, uh, to use a loose term, of the state. It belonged to communities. Uh, this continued for a time in in the colonial period, and then uh, that changed. Um, some of the property went into the hands of the indigenous aristocracy, which continued to be very important and to intermarry. And this is another of the differences between the US and um, the uh, Mesoamerica. We, you know, there are descendants of the Aztec emperors who are grandees of Spain and live in Spain. There are descendants of the Inca. Uh, an Inca princess marries the nephew of St. Ignatius Loyola and their two daughters marry into some of the grandest families in Spain. This doesn't happen in the US. Wow. So, but overall, um, land uh, was taken away from the indigenous people, uh, in some cases by the indigenous aristocracy, more often by the Spaniards. Uh, there was, and uh, for those who don't know Mexican history as well, you know, in 1910, the Mexican Revolution breaks out. It's the first great revolution of the 20th century. And for many, the key matter uh, was <clears throat> the return of land to the indigenous peoples. So that has been uh, something that has been very much a part of Mexico. And indeed, even in the colonial period, uh, in Mexico and other parts of Mesoamerica, the, in, the indigenous went to Spanish courts to get control of their land. Mm -hmm. We have huge, huge archives of land cases. So, you know, this has been going on. Would, would you say it's fair to say in terms of this notion of <laughs> Um, we now see you were standing on the native land of this is very common in, in sort of places in America where they're not in North America where mm -hmm. they're acknowledged. Is it a fair assessment just based on what you've told us is that the uh, sort of that what I've just described is a reaction to the erasure or this seeming erasure of native land, whereas native culture has been much more imbricated into society. So there isn't as much of a sense of we need to acknowledge this is the land of well, the Maya because they're they're very much part of the political and socioeconomic well, fabric there. Is that fair to say? Well, uh, yes, but that doesn't mean that they're not discriminated against, yeah, sure. that they're not uh, taken advantage of. but. It is impossible, almost impossible to be anywhere in Mexico or Central America and be unaware of indigenous yeah. cultures, civilizations, objects. You know, you go to the center of Mexico City, you have the great temple. You go yeah. almost anywhere in Mexico City and there's something there. Something was excavated, something is that you cannot get away from it. I went to Mexico for the first time and I went to Tulum and I was very happy to go visit the uh, the ruins there. So 
Yeah, I mean, you just, it's always there. Yeah. The people are there, the languages are there. I mean, in Tulum, if you're in the Yucatan and you go outside of the major tourist resorts, you're more likely to hear Yucatec Maya than yeah, Spanish. For sure. Um, Vin, do you want to uh, address this notion of land acknowledgement and, and where it fits in the notion of deep history here? Yeah. Well, I think I think Max, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, the you know the, the land acknowledgement uh, is sort of become important now as a way of of showing respect. And I think is, you're exactly right. It's a direct reaction to the erasure. It's sort of a way of uh, undoing the erasure. And so that it's it, in that sense, it's it's, a, it's completely understandable. Now, I will just also tell you if you if you sort of so it's it's a it's. It's something that is showing respect for people today, and it is something that is a sort of—it's almost like a political statement. Mm -hmm. If you look at it just purely as a scholar who is sort of enmeshed in the evidence and trying to sort of understand, um, you know, how sort of cultures change through time. I mean, the one thing I will just tell you: if there's one story that archaeology tells, not only in North America but worldwide, uh, it's that people move a lot. And the people who are here today were not there 100 years ago or 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago. And, and that's just a fact of human history. Um, I'm, and I'm uh, glad to hear you say that because when I teach world history since 1945, that's one of the main things I say. People have been moving and they will, they will continue to move. That's what we do. Right. And, and, and if you teach human history since uh, 16,000 BC uh, years ago, it's the same story. <laughs> OK, right. so that's one thing. And the other thing is that identities and nations are fluid. They come into being. They disappear. If you look at a map of Europe in medieval times, none of the national identities such as they were are the same as those today. And, and the same is true everywhere in the world, including including North America. So, I mean, there's really good scholarship. Um, that shows how many of the, the, the identities that are, that are important identities in, among Native American people today in the South uh, came into being in colonial times. Uh, so, you know, there, there's the Choctaw Nation came into being in the, you know, after 1680 as a confederation of peoples who were formally sort of separate. Um, uh, and, and, and similar arguments have, have been shown based on historical evidence for, for the Creek nation and so forth. That doesn't make those nations any less real or any less important, but it's just uh, the point is that historically there's been a lot of fluidity and then you get far enough back in time and it becomes very, very difficult to trace. You know, we don't know what people call themselves a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago or what languages they spoke. Uh, so we assign names to them as archeologists, which Vin, I, are you, uh, you froze for me, can... Uh... Yeah, he froze for me too. I thought I had, it was my computer because my connection is not great. Vin, can you hear us or have we, uh, have we lost you? I, 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 we were getting your point, absolutely. It sounds to me like if we were going to be a fully uh, comprehensive in our land acknowledgement, we would have a lot of names underneath that as they've gone through the layers of time. I will try to get Vin back. I don't know what happened with Vin. Hopefully he's, we're rebooting or something. We'll work on that. But the next question is great for you to start with, Eduardo. And we'll do that while we work on getting Vin back for the last few minutes here. Uh, Christi this is also from Katie Williams. Christianity is famous, infamous for taking the local religions and putting Christian events over top of them for ease of conversion. Uh, and also, by the way, vice versa, people adopting Christianity and bringing their own things into it. So how much of Central and South American Christianity has roots in these native ceremonies and religions that you've talked about? Uh, a bit. Um, you know, Christianity itself, it's something that's changed over time. Um, people from different parts of the world have added and subtracted things to it. Um, it we like to think that there is uh, something that was divinely ordained and it's never going to change, but it does, and it always has. And um, there are 
uh, indigenous traditions that have uh, seeped in. There are in Christian traditions that have seeped into um, <coughs> indigenous practice. I mean, for most of us uh, know uh, about Day of the Dead in Mexico. We think that it's one of these great Mexican traditions. That's Catholic. That entered, but today it's it's really felt in indigenous and mestizo communities. It's become part of them, uh, and this happens throughout history. So we can't. Things change in time, and uh, each group that absorbs something, whether it be willingly or not, uh, will inflect it in one way or another. Uh, and that's, I mean, I think that's inevitable. Vin, do you see any uh, any syncretic elements in Native American culture today that, I mean, you I, I, based on what you were telling us about Iliada and one of these are stories that have continued and continue today uh, in Native American culture, but any sense of, of Native, Native American conversion, syncretism uh, in, in some of the stories and whatnot that were told in the mound cultures that might be persistent in a syncretic form of Christianity? Well, um, I, I just, just speaking very, very generally, if you look at Indian communities in the East, the ones I'm familiar with and the people I know, uh, you know, you have a range. I mean, there's there's people who 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 are traditional religious leaders, uh, practice traditional religion. There are people who are Southern Baptists or or Presbyterians or you know, uh, so and and there are people who uh, may be Christian in terms of their religious practice, but they have spent a great deal of time talking to their elders and they know many of the ancient stories. So it, it's it's kind of all over the map. Um, and, um, and, and it's very hard, it's very hard to generalize. Um, I, I participate in meetings, um, that, uh, involve, uh, Native, uh, people, uh, and often these meetings start with a prayer, and, um, and sometimes that prayer is a, a traditional prayer done in a Native language. Sometimes it is a Christian prayer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's just, it, it just, it, there's a lot of yeah. there's a lot of variation. In, that, Vin, I'm glad you could come back. I know we're we're just about closing off here, but I apologize. Uh, I, I I think our internet went out. Uh, you yeah. all, I don't know, and I don't know where I stopped. I was talking away, and you all probably weren't listening because I was off the internet. But. You no, know, you were you were you were we caught you. You were at kind of a good break. I think okay, we got, we got some of what you're saying, but. Um, let me just ask you, was there anything that you were saying that you know that we missed? Or? I don't, I, I can't tell because when okay. I finished talking, you all were frozen and suddenly okay. I was off the internet. So this is the world we live in now, yes, isn't it? it is. You know, I like to say, I, if we added up all the hours of time that people have been asked to unmute or have done, oh. we would have, you know, collectively a, a millennia of time <laughs> that has been spent on asking people to unmute and whatnot. I want to end today by going, I've just, uh, uh, Paul Connick writes, thank you for these wonderful enlightening presentations, an end note on the church destructions of manuscripts. Uh, Heinz often cited observation where they burn books, they will in the end burn human beings too. To wit the shared fate of Giordano Bruno at Campo de Fiori a short time after the Mesoamericans manuscripts destruction in 1600. I think Paul's message there or, or comment there speaks to the absolute necessity for us to try to preserve the past uh, in its material and textual evidentiary form, to analyze it and to think about how it makes sense for us to help us understand ourselves today. And we're so happy that we could have this opportunity to have this humanistic discussion on the past, um, but also remember it's about the present as well and our own sense of community and society. So uh, I would like to thank um, Vincent Stepan Stepanitis, Eduardo Douglas. Thank you both. Again, listen closely. Thank you. To the ether. Thank you. <laughs> Coming up um, next uh, next up for us, for us folks, uh, we have next week a wonderful dialogue seminar on Ella Baker and Barack Obama, two obviously giants of African-American history. Um, and of course, you remember our Conceptions of Time seminar, which you will have an opportunity to do live 
And if you'd like to try to freeze yourself live, you can do that too, but uh, we'll have to see how that works. We hope you can join us for that. Lunch with Friends and Strangers, the biography program. And of course, please keep in mind, we are continuing our excellent work on K-12 education and helping our teachers and community colleges. Go to humanities.unc.edu to check us out. Follow us on Facebook. You know, all the things they say in the 21st century. Um, one more time, thank you, Vin Stepanitis, Eduardo Douglas. Thank you. Thank you Fantastic. all. Thank yeah, you we, all. And we enjoyed it. And everyone out there, have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next time. You too. All right. Take bye -bye. care.